Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Hall, and here you are, back in chapter 11, or part 3. As we've left off, we've now moved on, and we've gone back to where we were with the spinal cord. The spinal cord has two main functions. It is there, functioning as the center for spinal reflexes, and the, as the conduit for impulses going to and from the brain. So as the spinal cord does each of those, it also serves to allow us to have those things known as reflex. So I call it the communication in the nervous system. Combines that series of action potentials along the axon of a neuron and synaptic transmission between that neuron and a post-synaptic cell. Two or more neurons involved in such communication constitute a nerve pathway. So the simplest of the nerve pathways begins with a sensory receptor and ends with an effector. And it includes as few as two neurons, such as the nerve pathway is called a reflex. So again, I'll say a reflex is nothing more than a sensory receptor and an effector. Having said it in such a way, you can look at what you have here being shown. And you'll find that same figure in your textbook on page 413. It's figure 1116a. So what happens is there is the receptor. By way of that receptor, information will be sent, sensory information is sent, along that afferent pathway. It gets there to the central nervous system. And of course, thereafter, along that efferent pathway, or to that mode neuron, we get to, of course, some effector or gland. I cannot define a reflex any simpler than that. I say again, it, of course, has a sensory receptor and ends with an effector and has to have at least two neurons. So all reflexes share the same basic components, which together are known as a reflex arc. This is on your test. Please see this again. So the reflex arc is what begins with a sensory receptor at the dendritic end of a sensory neuron, taking those impulses in. Impulses on these sensory neurons enter the central nervous system and constitute a sensory or afferent limb of the reflex, as I just mentioned, looking at figure 1116a. The central nervous system is a processing center. Afferent neurons may synapse with interneurons, which may in turn connect with other parts of the central nervous system. Afferent neurons or interneurons ultimately connect with motor neurons, whose fibers pass outward from the central nervous system to effectors. So the textbook states that it may help to remember that efferent neurons, efferent neurons control effectors. So I say again, the efferent neurons control effectors. That's in your textbook. You'll find that on page 412. It's in that next to the last full paragraph. Well, excuse me, it's in that paragraph right before the full paragraph on the right-hand column. Reflexes occur throughout the central nervous system. Those that involve the spinal cord are known as spinal reflexes, and they reflect the simplest level of central nervous system function. If you take some time to see figure 11.16b, 11.16b, which I am now showing to you, you will see the following components. So if you look closely, a reflex arc is usually including a, a receptor, b, a sensory neuron, and C, integration with the central nervous system involving at least one synapse, D, a motor neuron, and E, an effector. So in the example you're seeing here, from, and I, I'm sorry for using letters, I should have said one, a receptor, two, a sensory neuron, three, what you have there in the center, known as integration within the central nervous system involving at least one synapse, four, a motor neuron, and five, some effector. So having those components there, this is 
that simple spinal reflex. So on your test, you can look for a figure that looks just like this, showing you all those five basic components that make up the reflex arc. And I guess I'll go back to where I was there. So having done it in such a way, let's get down to what is called reflex behavior. And as I've said that I had a thought, this figure being shown here, let me find this figure for you just briefly. Excuse me. I'd like to say I don't see this figure. That shows parts of the reflex arc. I thought this was in your text, and I'm not seeing this figure. So, yes, look at table 11.6. The figure is in your textbook. I say again, table 11.6 is found on page 415. So now that you're aware I am here with the presentation, I would say you should use this to give you a concise way of putting all the parts together. So back to where I was going. The reason I stopped here is because it gives you those effectors at the bottom. This is important to know because you may someday be asked, all right, what is the effector? Well, effectors are always going to be something such as a muscle or a gland. So they respond to that simulation. It all began below some receptor. And of course, by way of that motor neuron, it produces some reflex or behavioral action. Important to know, I say. Now on to reflex behavior as I just left off, excuse me. So reflexes are automatic responses to changes, or at least to stimuli, and this happens inside or outside the body. They maintain homeostasis by controlling many involuntary processes such as heart rate, breathing rate, blood pressure, and digestion. I'll say again, a reflex, as I defined earlier, as having a central receptor and ending with an effector, including at least, or at least as few as two neurons, a reflex is an automatic response to stimuli, being inside or outside the body. So reflexes also carry out automatic actions involved in swallowing, vomiting, coughing, and sneezing. The first reflex example is going to be that patellar reflex or knee jerk reflex. So this is an example of a monosynaptic reflex and it's called a monosynaptic reflex because it only involves two neurons. There again, that most simplest reflex type. So it involves a sensory neuron that communicates directly to a motor neuron. So, if you can strike the patella ligament just below the patella, it initiates this reflex. So the quadriceps, the femoris muscle, so I say the quadriceps femoris muscle group, attached to the patella by a tendon, is pulled slightly, simulating the stretch receptors in the muscle group. These receptors in turn trigger the impulses that pass along the peripheral process. And this happens along the axon of a unipolar central neuron, continu continuing along the central process of the axon into the lumbar region of the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, the central neuron synapses with a motor neuron. And now an impulse is then triggered on the motor neuron along this here e e efferent pathway and is conducted along its axon to the neuromuscular junctions, hint, 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 and in that motor unit of the quadriceps femoris. So the muscle fibers involved respond by contracting, and the reflex is completed as the leg extends, as shown here in figure 1117. So I know you say, oh, if you took a long time to get there. Well, Yes, I did. And even though this is a quite simple process, I say physiologically, it's important that I take that time to show you this. And another thing that happens is the patellar reflex helps maintain upright posture. So, if a person is standing still and the knee begins to bend in response to gravity, the quadriceps femoris is stretched. So the, refl the reflex is triggered and the leg shrugs again. Adjustments within the stretch receptors keep the reflex responsive at different muscle lengths. And this very same thing happens when you stand up from a seated position. 
It ensures, of course, that the knee doesn't buckle. Another reflex type we're now at is the withdrawal reflex. So this happens, class, when a person touches something painful and potentially damaging, such as stepping on a tack or a shard of glass. So it's activated skin receptors, send impulses to the spinal cord along the axons of sensory neurons. There, the sensory neurons synapse with interneurons, which in turn synapse with motor neurons. In this case, the motor neurons. In this case, the motor neurons activate fibers and the flexor muscles of the thigh, which contract in response, pulling the foot away from the painful stimulus. Please note, the skeletal muscles typically are innervated by motor neurons at more than one level of the spinal cord. Although one or two levels of the spinal cord may predominate, this is called segmental innervation. The example here, the biceps brachii are innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve with the axons originating from C5, C6, and C7. As I've stated this, similarly, the gastrocnemius is innervated by the tibial nerve with axons originating from S1 and S2. So segmental innervation of the quadriceps and hamstring groups in in this example of the withdrawal reflex. It's quite amazing how this works, happening so fast without you even thinking about it. So please be safe out there. So at the same time, some of the incoming sensory impulses, they stimulate the interneurons that inhibit the action of the antagonistic extensor muscles. This is reciprocal innovation. So this inhibition of the, and the antagonists allow the flexor muscles to effectively, effectively excuse me, withdraw the affected part of the body. How amazing this is. So it says here that this example is most definitely polysynaptic, containing the sensory neuron, containing the sensory neuron, which is shown here, to feel, to sense the pain while sitting on that tack. It includes, of course, what is within, known as the interneuron, shown there in red, and then finally, What's shown here is that motor neuron, getting to here what is called the effector. This is the withdrawal reflex. Up next is the crossed extensor reflex. So while the flexor muscles on the affected side, which is known as being ipsilateral side, contract, the flexor muscles of the limb on the other side, being contralateral, are inhibited. Furthermore, the extensor muscles on the contralateral side contract, helping to support the body weight shifted to that side. So this is that crossed extensor reflex and is due to the interneuron pathways in the spinal cord that allow sensory impulses arriving on one side of the spinal cord to pass to the other side and produce an opposite effect. Please see figure 1119. Reflexes like these can be found at different levels of the spinal cord and in the brain, depending upon which body parts are involved. So concurrent with the withdrawal reflex, other interneurons in the spinal cord carry sensory impulses upward toward the brain. The person becomes aware of the experience and may feel pain. So the withdrawal reflex protects because it prevents or limits tissue damage when the body part touches something potentially harmful. So with the crossed extension reflex, I'll put it this way. Let's say, for instance, that a person is walking. And then, of course, they step on that very same thumbtack or they step on that shard of glass wearing those shoes. So immediately, if you were to step on anything that were to cause that pain, the first thing you're going to do is pick that foot up, and then, of course, step on the opposite foot. That is that cross extension reflex. Because it won't be the case that you simply just step on it and say, ouch, this hurts. You want to step on that, and then as soon as you step on it, you're going to switch over to the other foot, 
And then, of course, that is it, the necrostic sensory reflex. So from here, just make sure you all do see table 11.6, as I mentioned earlier, to summarize the reflex arc. So I'll now get to uses of reflexes with clinical application, 11.5, found on page 414. <clears throat> Excuse me. So normal reflexes require and reflect normal neuron functions. Therefore, reflexes are commonly used to assess the condition of a nervous system. For instance, an anesthesiologist initiates a reflex in a patient being anesthetized to determine how the anesthetic drug is affecting nerve functions. In the very same way, a physician assesses a patient with injury to the nervous system by observing reflexes to judge the location and extent of damage. So injury to any component of a reflex arc alters its function. For example, stroking the sole of a foot normally initiates the plantar reflex, which flexes the foot and toes. Damage to certain nerve pathways, such as that cortical spinal tract, may trigger an abnormal response called the Babinski reflex, which is dorsiflexion that extends the gray toe upward and fans apart the smaller toes. If, in fact, the injury is minor, the response may consist of plantar flexion with the failure of the great toe to flex, or plantar flexion followed by dorsiflexion. The Binsky reflex, make a note class, make a note class, is normally present in infants up to age of 12 months and may reflect immaturity in their cortical spinal tracts. So typical me is to do the very same to my now daughter, who is just two months old, to elicit this Babinski reflex. And if need be, just let me know, class, and I don't mind recording a video to show you this Babinski reflex. It's amazing to see, I say, at least to myself. So other reflexes that may be tested during a neurological animation include the following. They are the biceps jerk reflex, which is elicited by extending a person's forearm at the elbow, and then the examiner places a finger on the inside of the extended elbow over the tendon of the biceps and then taps the finger. The biceps contract in response, flexing the elbow. Up next is the triceps jerk reflex. It is elicited by flexing the person's forearm at the elbow and then tapping on the tendon of the, sh the short tendon of the triceps muscle close to its insertion of the tip of the elbow. The muscle contracts in response to extending the elbow. Next up are abdominal reflexes. And they are responsible to, to sh stroking the skin of the abdomen. For example, a dull pin drawn from the sides of the abdomen upward toward the midline above the umbilicus contracts the abdominal muscles underlying the skin, and the umbilical moves toward the semi region. The ankle jerk reflex is elicited by tapping the calcaneal tendon, the calcaneal, excuse me, tendon, just above its insertion on the calcaneus. Contraction of the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles cause plantar flexion. And lastly is the chromasteric reflex. It is elicited in males by stroking the upper inside thigh, and in response, the contracting muscles elevate the testis on the same side. And no, we will not be doing that reflex in lab. So from here, I'll move on over. And the next part we'll get to will be nerve fiber classification. And but first, we'll get to spinal cord injuries with clinical application 11.6, and then we'll get to nerve fiber classification, excuse me. So we'll begin here. It mentions that amyotropic lateral sclerosis. So as it's there, spinal cord injuries causes are the most common causes of workplace and motor vehicle accidents. As I say it in such a way, 
many times people are on vehicles or even just, I guess I'll say driving distracted and they happen to be in some accident and from said accident they have some spinal cord injury. I'm seeing the typo in the, in the presentation. In the presentation it says that's clinical application 11.6 but in your textbook class that is incorrect. This is on page 420 and this is in fact clinical application 11.7 this is not going to application 11.6. I will do that application, but I'll begin with this one here now. So, as I mentioned moments ago, thousands of people sustain spinal cord injuries each year, and this is the most common cause in the workplace and by way of a motor vehicle accident. So, this treatment for spinal cord injury begins as soon as help arrives at the accident scene, and emergency healthcare workers establish and maintain the person's ability to breathe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then they use a rigid neck collar and carrying board to mobilize the, the person for transport. In the emergency department, a steroid drug called methylprednisolone is given within the first eight hours to minimize inflammation. Surgery may be done to remove bone fragments, and then continuing immobilization is crucial because damage continues over days. During this time, the vertebrae are compressed and may break, killing many neurons. Dying neurons release calcium ions, which activate tissue degrading enzymes. Then white blood cells arrive to produce inflammation that can destroy healthy as well as damaged neurons. Axons tear, myelin coatings are stripped off, and vital connections between neurons and muscle fibers are lost. So the tissue cannot, the tissue cannot, I say again class, that tissue cannot regenerate. It's a mitotic. By the third day, a complete neurological exam and MRIs are done. I'll say it this way. The extent and severity of spinal cord injury depends on, of course, the location of damage. And, of course, the extent of the damage. Normal spinal reflexes require two-way communication between the spinal cord and the brain. A complete transection, meaning damage through a cross-section of the cord, injures nerve pathways, depressing the cord's reflex activities in the sites below the injury, and at the same time, those sensations and muscle tone diminish in the parts that are affected. Fibers innervate. So the condition is called spinal shock and it may last for days or weeks, although normal re reflex activity may return. If axons are severed, some of the cord's functions may be permanently lost. So less severe injuries to the spinal cord, such as a blow to the head, whiplash, or even the rupture of an inter intervertebral disc can compress or distort the cord. If you look closely at figure 11G, you're seeing just that, meaning the dislocation of the atlas may cause a compression injury to the spinal cord. So it may be that the person experiences pain, weakness, and muscular atrophy may develop in those regions the damaged nerves supply. So a spinal cord injury increases the risk of secondary problems, and these include difficulty breathing if the injury is above the fifth cervical vertebra, development of pneumonia, formation of blood clots, low blood pressure, and irregular heartbeat, pressure ulcers, spasticity, and impaired bowel, bladder, and sexual function. I'll put it this way. For those who drive, which I think most of you all do, I'm pretty confident all of you all do. Please drive and remain undistracted as you drive. In other words, please put those phones away as you drive. The two most common causes, this is I think the fourth time I've stated this, of spinal cord injury are of course accidents in the workplace and motor vehicle accidents. And in fact, I heard just, I think it was, what day was it? I think it was just two days ago, yes, two to three days ago, a friend of mine had a family member who was killed, who was crushed on the job. 
to be safe as you work. The third most common cause of a spinal cord injury is the sports injury. The spinal cord injury may result from a sudden and unexpected movement. For example, one man suffered a severe spinal cord injury as a powerful wave knocked him down while he was just standing in one foot of water at the shoreline. So it's regardless of the cause. If nerve fibers in the ascending tracks are cut, sensations arising from chapters below the level of injury are lost. So damage to the, to the descending tracks results in loss of motor functions below the level of the injury. So problems of this type in fibers of descending tracks produce upper motor neuron syndrome, which are characterized by spastic paralysis in which muscle tone increases with little atrophy of the muscles. A hemi lesion of the spinal cord, which of course means that the spinal cord has been severed, you all, on just one side, affecting the cortical, spinal, and spinothalamic tracts, can cause brown sequard syndrome. So the ascending tracts cross over at different levels, so the injured side of the body becomes paralyzed and loses touch sensation. The other side of the body retains movement, but loses sensations of pain and temperature. And of course, injury to motor neurons in the anterior horns of the spinal cord results in lower motor neuron syndrome, and it produces flaccid paralysis, which is that total loss of muscle tone and reflex activity, and you get muscle atrophy. I can't stress enough, class, that you all should, should take care of yourselves as you all are out because these spinal injuries are serious. So next from here, before I get to the peripheral nervous system here, I'll take myself back to the actual clinical application called 11.6. So with this clinical application, it is about the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. In amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease or motor neuron disease or even ALS, which you all may have had a challenge with a bucket of ice. The motor neurons in the spinal cord, brain stem, and the cerebral cortex degenerate. In this disease, it may be due to an inability of the motor neurons or associated astrocytes to counter the buildup of oxygen free radicals or overactive microglia that kill motor neurons. The first symptoms of ALS may be vague and affect only a small part of the body, being that a person is dragging their foot, becomes clumsy, has problems with fine motor coordination such as turning a key or pulling a zipper, or even experiences fatigue and difficulty speaking. So muscle twistiness causes those fasciculations may prompt the person to seek medical attention. The diagnosis may take more than a year as neuro neurologists observe spreading weakness and rules out other conditions such as multiple sclerosis, which you should know for your test, having those multiple sclerosis, or even a spinal cord tumor. The average age at diagnosis is 55 for adolescents as well as very, very elderly have developed amyotropic lateral sclerosis. ALS affects the upper and lower parts of the body and progresses faster if symptoms begin in the face or neck, which is called bulbar onset, compared to the arms, which would be, of course, arms and legs, which is limb onset. Usually, class, the battle is lost two to five years after diagnosis typically from respiratory failure, but about 10% of patients live more than a decade with the disease. ALS has no cure class. However, there is a drug called Rulotic, which may extend time until respiratory difficulty. Assisted breathing devices may be used, including a ventilator to sustain life. Although about half of the people with ALS experience some cognitive decline, the mind remains sharp and may be. One patient wrote a novel during his last months, another remained a brilliant songwriter. 
so I say about 10% of ALS cases are inherited due to mutations in any of several genes, so it's not just a single gene mutation class. Because the prevalence has been increasing over the past few years at a faster rate than the aging of the population can explain, an environmental trigger may very well be a contributor that may combine with the inherited susceptibility to cause the disease of neotropic lateral sclerosis. So from here, I'll continue on. So now at nerve and nerve fiber classification. So just to make sure you all recall that the nerves are bundles of nerve fibers or axons, and nerves have only fibers of sensor neurons, conducting impulses into the brain or spinal cord, and those are called sensor nerves. I say again, those nerves that have only fibers of sensor neurons that conduct impulses into the brain or spinal cord are called sensory nerves. Nerves that have only fibers involved in motor control are known as motor nerves. However, class, most nerves include both sensory and motor fibers, hence they are known as mixed nerves. Nerves originated from the brain that communicate with other body parts are called cranial nerves, whereas nerves originating from the spinal cord that communicate with other body parts are known as spinal nerves. So the nerve fibers in the cranial and spinal nerves can be subdivided further into four groups. So they could be the general somatic efferent fibers, general visceral efferent fibers, general somatic afferent fibers, and general visceral afferent fibers. So as I've done it in this way, that'll be all I'll do for classification. And as I turn back, just make sure you all have not forgotten about the divisions of the peripheral nervous system. That is integral to knowledge, and we've known that already. One thing that I have not yet done, of course, has got to the connective tissue coverings of nerves. They are known as follows. They are the outermost covering would be the epineurium. The outermost covering would be the epineurium. Going from the outermost covering, just inside, that would be, of course, what is known as the paraneurium. The paraneurium. So the paraneurium is what, of course, encapsulates, encapsulates excuse me, the fossils. And then finally, each individual axon is covered by the endoneurium. Endoneurium. So as I say it this way, this is the very same way you all learned about those connective tissue sheaths that cover muscle. From here, we'll now get to the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves. So there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and they are located on the underside of the brain. Most of the cranial nerves are mixed nerves, but some of those are associated with the special senses, such as smell, and vision, and they have only sensory fibers. Other cranial nerves that innervate muscles and glands are primarily composed of motor fibers. So the first pair, which is sensory, has fibers that begin in the nasal cavity and synapse with the frontal lobe of the cerebrum. The second pair, they also are sensory and they originate in the eyes. Their fibers synapse in thalamus. The remaining cranial nerves attach to the brain stem, and the direction of their fibers depends on whether they are sensory, motor, or mixed. When I say all of the cranial nerves pass from their sites of attachment through the foramen of the skull and lead to areas of the head, neck, and trunk. So the cranial nerves that are described here are primarily motor do have limited sensory functions because they contain neurons associated with certain receptors, known as proprioceptors, please review those, that respond to changes in the length and force of contraction of the muscles. However, because these proprioceptive fibers contribute directly to motor control, the cranial nerves, whose only sensory component is from such proprioceptors, are considered motor nerves. 
So that's your first two cranial nerves. Three, four, six, 11, and 12. So let us begin. The first pair of cranial nerves is the olfactory. They are associated with the sense of smell. The first pair associated with the sense of smell. They're bipolar neurons. They, pair, they pass through the arcuiform plate of the ethmoid bone and enter into the olfactory bulbs. So here, by way of the olfactory tracts in the cerebral hemispheres, they produce the sensation of smell. Next to optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two. So the optic nerves, they are sensory and they lead from the eyes to the brain. They are associated with vision neural. So the neurons in our bodies, they form ganglion layers of retina and pass through the optic foramina of the orbits. So with this, we, will do, we did more of this with visual pathways in the brain in chapter 12. Up next will be the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve number three. So the ocular motor nerve, it arises from the midbrain and then it passes into the orbits of the eyes. So with this, one component of each nerve connects to the voluntary muscles, including those that raise the eyelids and four of the six muscles that move the eye. And that's four of those six extrinsic eye muscles. The second portion of each ocular motor nerve, ocular motor nerve, is part of the autonomic nerve system, supplying the involuntary muscles inside the eyes. So these muscles help adjust the amount of light that enters the eyes and help and help focus the lenses. This nerve is considered motor with some proprioceptive fibers. I find this interesting here because I thought for a moment that my eyes had gotten really, really bad. So the other day, I went to the optometrist to have my eyes checked, to have an eye exam, of course. And the optometrist, I don't necessarily say that he laughed at me, but uh, as, I, as I was walking out the hallway to leave, he showed up. He said, I wish I had your eyes, because my eyes have no, no issues at all. However, I thought that there were serious issues. Thanks a lot, tickers at, at the bottom of the screen. So next up is cranial nerve number four, and they are known as the trochlear nerve or trochlear nerves. This is that smallest pair of cranial nerves. They arise from the midbrain and conduct motor impulses to a fifth pair of external eye muscles. And I'll leave it at that. Up next class will be cranial nerve number five, meaning the trigeminal nerve. So the, tri the trigeminal nerve is the trigeminal nerves, excuse me, they are the largest and they arise from the pons. So they are mixed nerves with more extensive sensory portions. So each sensory component includes three large branches called the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular division. So with that, please see figure 1126 in your text. So it shows that each trigeminal nerve has three large branches that supply various regions of the head and face. So I just mentioned the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, which is sensory as well, and then the mandibular division, which is both sensory and motor. And these are those muscles used for mastication. And you'll hear about mastication pretty soon here when you get to human anatomy and physiology too, when you get to the digestive system. Mastication between the food. Remember it, class, you need it. From here, I'll move on to the abducens nerve, the sixth pair of cranial nerves. So they are small and they originate from the pons near the medulla oblongata. They enter the orbits of the eye and supply motor impulses to the remaining pair of external eye muscles. So this nerve is motor with some proprioceptive fibers. From here, we have the cranial nerve number seven. So this pair are known as the facial nerves. So the facial nerves are mixed nerves and they arise from the lower part of the pons and emerge on the sides of the face. Their sensory branches are associated with taste receptors on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and some of their motor fibers conduct impulses to the muscles of facial expression. To help you with that, please see figure 1127. So with this, some, some of the fibers have functions in the alternate nervous system, by stimulating secretions from the tear glands and certain salivary glands. 
and that comes from your submandibular and sublingual glands you all. Up next would be cranial nerve number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. So this is of course here for the acoustical auditory nerves and they are center nerves that arise from the medulla oblongata and each of these has two distinct parents. They have a vestibular branch and a cochlear branch. So the vestibular branch are here and these contain receptors that sense changing in changes in the position of the head and in response and initiate and send impulses to the cerebellum. With that they are also used in reflexes that maintain equilibrium. The cochlear branch here their impulses are here for hearing receptors so they pass through the middle of the and to the midbrain and on their way to the temporal lobe where they are interpreted. Up next is that ninth pair, which is, of course, the glossopharyngeal nerves. So it is a mixed nerve, and they are associated with the tongue and pharynx. So these nerves, they arise from the medulla oblongata. They are mixed nerves, too. And they conduct impulses from the lining of the pharynx, tonsils, and posterior of the tongue to the brain. So with this, they, those fibers have a motor component that innervate certain salivary glands and a constrictor muscle in the wall of the pharynx that functions in swallowing. You must be able to swallow. Up next is cranial nerve number 10, the 10th pair, called the vagus nerves. We've done a lot with these. I won't continue at more with these. I'll say please review that second of now being three lectures in chapter 11 for more on the vagus nerves. I guess the last thing I'll mention, of course, about them is that they originate in the middle of the gata, descending downward into the neck, into the chest, and the abdomen. They are mixed nerves being both somatic and alternate branches, with the alternate fibers being predominant. If you have forgotten this, please go back and review that lecture because you have a number of test questions that will test you on what the 10th paracranial nerves function to do. Up next, of course, we'll get to, oh, I don't want to go so quickly. Let's see figure 1128. With figure 1128, I spent a, a number of minutes here in prior lectures, <clears throat> or at least one prior lecture for sure. And just make sure you see this. Particularly, of course, I'm looking here at the vagus nerves. So the vagus nerves, and, and, and it says only the left vagus nerve is shown, not both pairs. It's showing you the viscera. And as I say the viscera, this is what it does. I mentioned us having these differing divisions of the nervous system. For those who study and study it well, I mentioned once that there are two divisions of the nervous system, being the autonomic nervous system, being that parasympathetic nervous system, and the sympathetic nervous system. I mentioned that rest and digest system. We're looking at, of course, here and now, and even why. So please, I hope that you all have taken amazing notes leading up to now. Because I, I mentioned this here at the heart, but we have that cardiac plexus that slows heart rate. Not to mention, of course, the pulmonary plexus. But I'll stop there. Please review those things. So now, of course, we get to the 11th paracranial nerve. It's called the accessory nerve. Those accessory nerves originate in the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord. Therefore, these nerves have both cranial and spinal branches. So each cranial nerve joins a vagus nerve and conducts impulses to the muscles of the soft palate, the pharynx, and the larynx. So the spinal branch descends into the neck and supplies motor fibers to the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. To the trapezius muscle and sternocleidomastoid muscle. This muscle is motor with some proprioceptive fibers. And the last is the twelfth, of course, pair of cranial nerves, and it's called the hypoglossal nerve. It is primarily a motor nerve, and with this it arises from the middle of the and it passes into the tongue. So with this, it, the impulses are conducted to the muscles that move the tongue in speaking as I speak now, chewing and swallowing. If you need more on this, you may see table 11.9. You'll find it on page 425. It gives you all, all of these nerves in one spot. Of course, it's not a lot of information that's there, but it does give you all of what I've just done. 
Up next are the spinal nerves. So there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and I'll be honest and I'll say I will not go through all of these, but what I will do is I'll go down to where it states what they do. So those 31 pairs of spinal nerves, which originate from the spinal cord, the first pair is purely motor, and the remaining pairs are mixed nerves that provide two-way communication. That provide two-way communication between the spinal cord and parts of the upper and lower limbs, neck, and trunk. So each spinal nerve, except for the first pair, emerges from the spinal cord by two short branches or roots, which lie in the vertebral column. So the roots arising from the superior part of the spinal cord pass outward, almost horizontally, whereas those from the inferior portion of the spinal cord descend at sharp angles. So this anatomical feature is a consequence of growth. In early life, the spinal cord extends the entire length of the vertebral column. But with age, the column grows more rapidly than the cord, thus the adult spinal cord ends at the level between the first and second lumbar vertebrae. So the roots associated with the lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal nerves descend to their exits beyond the end of the cord, still within the vertebral canal. So these descending roots form a structure called the cauda equina. So I'll go on down now to each spinal cord below C1. And I'm saying this because what you have are those 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And I'm, one way to help you all remember these, of course, would be there are eight cervical nerves, C1 and C8. 12 thoracic nerves, so of course T1 to T12, 5 lumbar nerves, L1 to L5, 5 sacral nerves, S1 to S5, and of course 1 coccygeal nerve. So a person once said that you can remember this by knowing what time after which you eat. You have breakfast at 8 a.m., lunch at 12, and of course dinner at 5, and that's, that's twice at 5. So you have 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, and sacral, with 1 coccygeal nerve. 8, 12, 5, 5, 1. So each spinal nerve below C1 contains sensory fibers that reach the skin, and the region innervated is called a dermatome. Please see 1130, that is figure 1130. This is a new test. So the dermatomes are highly organized, but vary considerably in size and shape. So it's a map of dermatomes, figure 1130 is, and it's useful in localizing the site of injury to dorsal roots and to the spinal cord. I mention this because as you look at the figure showing those dermatomes shown to you all now, this is what is used when someone may come in and ask, hi, how are you doing today, sir or ma'am? And of course you reply, but as you do reply, they're touching you, meaning they may be touching your, your belly. They may be touching your toes, or even, of course, your shoulder, or, or a specific part of your hand. And that person is doing that to assess you as a patient, because these dermatomes are surely there to provide that information as far as what has been the case in some injury that you've experienced, be it in a car, or somewhere off of a, like a, off of a ladder from some dr dramatic fall. So just keep in mind that spinal, spinal nerve, C1, does not supply any skin at all. So from here, class, make sure you all do review spinal nerve injuries, which is clinical application 11.8. I say again, please, class, make sure you all review spinal nerve injuries, which you all can find on page 431. It will help you to review that the very same way. I'll say, make sure you go through, where was it? I think that was at the very end of which. So I've now gotten to the end of the chapter, right before lifespan changes, and this is on page 438. 438. So as I've gotten here, and of course this gets you all to spinal cord injuries, 
especially, of course, whiplash, how they are caused, and, of course, carpal tunnel syndrome, which some of you all may have right now. I don't know. But as I mentioned this, I'll say that control of the alternate nervous system rests mainly there in the hypothalamus. So just keep in mind that it's hypothalamic activity that's important in those reflex centers and involving the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord. That's all I want to say there. So to end this thing, we go to lifespan changes. As we're here, the redundancies of overlap of the functions in our nervous systems ensure that we can perceive and interact with the environment for many decades. And I did say for many decades. In a sense, aging them, of course, this organ system begins before birth. Yes, I did say that before you're born, aging has already begun to occur. It's because, of course, as apoptosis occurs, which is programmed cell death, this is, of course, it's carving out those structures that will remain in the brain. So this normal dying off of neurons continues throughout life, and when the, when the brain apoptosis fails, disease results. The example of such would be with the brains of individuals who die of schizophrenia as young adults. They contain the same number of neurons as do neuro newborns. You're saying, wait a minute, you're saying what now? Yes, a person, of course, who, of course, dies of schizophrenia as an adult contains the same number of neurons as a newborn child. Those extra neurons may produce extra dopamine, which can lead to those hallucinations, which of course are the hallmark of schizophrenia. Myelin begins to form on axons during the 14th week of prenatal development. How early is it? At the time of birth, many axons are not completely myelinated. So all the myelinated axons have begun to develop sheaths by the time it starts to walk. And yes, that's at around a year old. Around a year old. Maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later. So having stated in such a way, I'll just put it this way. The process of myelination continues into adolescence. That's why it's so important, of course, to take care of yourselves. And I just say adolescence. By age 30, the die off of neurons accelerates somewhat. Yes, I'm saying that now I'm just over 30. So, although pockets of neural stem cells lining the ventricles retain the capacity to give rise to cells that differentiate as neurons and neural glia over an average lifetime, the brain shrinks about 10% with more loss of the gray matter than the white matter. Neuron loss is uneven, and many cells die in the temporal lobe. For example, but very few die in the brainstem. And I hope that you all know why. If you don't know why, please go back and review what was stated about the brainstem and function. So by age 90, the frontal cortex has lost about half of its neurons, although this deficit does not necessarily hamper its function. So you most definitely can teach an old dog new tricks, so to speak. I'm not referring to dogs, I'm referring to us as people. So the nervous system changes over time in several ways. And the number of dendritic branches in the cerebral cortex falls. And signs of slow neurotransmission include decreasing levels of neurotransmitters, the enzymes necessary to synthesize them, and the numbers of post-symmetric receptors. So the rate of act potential propagation may decrease 5 or even 10%. 10 so it's that nervous system disorders that may begin to cause symptoms in older adulthood, which include stroke, depression, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and multi-infarct dementia. So notable sub signs of aging include a fading memory, slowed responses, and even reflexes. It also includes that decline in function of the sympathetic nervous system, which may cause the transient drops in blood pressure, which in turn may cause fainting. So by the seventh decade, the waning ability of nerves in the ankles to respond to vibrations from walking may affect balance, raising the risk of falling. Poor eyesight, anemia, inner ear malfunction, and the effects of drugs contribute to poor balance in later years. 
So because of these factors, nearly one-third of individuals over age 65 have at least one serious fall per year. And, of course, as you get over 65, you may have more than one serious fall, but at least one serious fall per year. There will also be changes in sleep patterns that accompany aging that reflect, of course, the function of the reticular activating system. So it is, of course, that older individuals generally sleep a few hours per night than they once did. So they experience that transient difficulty in getting to sleep and staying asleep, with more frequent movements when they are sleeping. And many have bouts with insomnia, which sometimes not sleeping more than an hour or two at night. So I just hope that you keep these in mind, because all of these changes may result in daytime sleepiness and nodding. So with this, the next lecture will be, of course, that of review. And if you need anything further, please let me know. This has been your instructor, Scholar Huff, preparing world class.